Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky Athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. You can make every moment more by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to preview what could arguably be the biggest game of the season, Kentucky versus Kansas. And I mean whenever I say biggest of the season, obviously I mean specifically for the Wildcats. We're going to take a dive into what the numbers mean in this game for Kansas in case any of you out there have not been paying attention to what they've been doing. We're going to dive into the matchup, some individual Kansas players that I think could give Kentucky problems, and we're also Another time, we're going to take a look at the current bracketology for ESPN and CBS Sports. Now, last year, whenever I did bracketology, it kind of felt fruitless whenever I discussed it on this show because it was less about where Kentucky was going to be and more about, oh, by the way, we're still here. This season, it's a little bit different because Kentucky is somewhat of a fringe tournament team, at least right now. This game would be a massive resume booster for the Wildcats. So let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky versus Kansas, the numbers overall for the Jayhawks. The first thing that I want to point out today is actually a quote from one of our friends of the program, Sean Venzel of Hoops Insight. If you are not subscribed to his new let- newsletter, I would highly encourage you guys to go do that. He has a free version and a paid version, but on the free version, he noted something interesting about Kansas statistically. He said this, the only thing Kansas ranks in the top 25 in is defensive steal percentage, which is very useful, but isn't enough on its own to make a team into one of the top 10. In case you're wondering, guys, Ken Palm currently ranks Kansas as a top 10 team in the country. He also goes on to say, Sean does, Kansas is barely in the top 100 in any offensive stat, and while they are very good at defending twos, they are worse than 200th in both defensive rebounding and opponent free throw rate. So how exactly are the Kansas Jayhawks top 25 in offensive efficiency and number 18 in defensive efficiency? Statistically, when you look at these Jayhawks, and this is me talking now, they are a pretty solid team, but like Sean notes, they aren't particularly good at anything really there are a couple things on the defensive end that are they're pretty solid at but they're not like really elite at so why are they overall graded out so highly according to Ken Palm well it's simply because of their schedule they have played up until this point arguably the most difficult schedule in the country according to Ken Palm they have the number one overall strength of schedule It's the most difficult schedule in the country. The second closest right now, if I'm not uh, mistaken, is Houston. I may be wrong on that. Uh, I would have to go pull it up and look. But it has been proven that Kansas has one of the most difficult stretches in the nation right now as they wade through conference play because they've lost three games in a row and they've had to play three top 25 opponents on Kimpom three games in a row. Bill Self has very seldom in his Kansas career, lost three games in a row. He has never, ever lost four games in a row. And this Saturday, Kentucky's going to try and make that happen. The three games that Kansas lost were to Kansas State in overtime on the road. They lost to TCU by 23 points at home, and then they lost to Baylor by six on the road. I want to take a look more specifically at what happened in those Kansas State and Baylor games because the TCU game ended up being less, in my opinion, of what Kansas did and more about the fact that TCU just ended up shooting really, really well. It was just a hot team. When you look at what Kansas has done in these two losses, I think it's pretty clear the Jayhawks have struggled to shoot the three ball. They have been really, really good from two. I think you can expect that from a Kansas team, from a Bill Self team, rather. They've been a good free throw shooting team, but they have statistically been terrible from beyond the arc, and they've continued 
to take a decent amount of shots from that area. In those two games, in the loss to Kansas State in overtime, they shot 29 threes and only made six of them. In the loss to Baylor, they shot 19 threes and only made five of them. Thank goodness they shot 16 of 16 from the foul line. Otherwise, that game might have been a little bit less competitive. It's also about what Kansas is doing in the turnover department. They turned the ball over 15 times each in both of those losses. Now, the Baylor game was a little bit different because Baylor ended up not turning the ball over a ton themselves. They ended up holding on to the ball, and they ended up creating a lot of steals and different things like that. But it has been, I think, in my opinion, when Kansas has gone cold in these two games, it's been what they've done beyond the arc. To be completely honest with you, I don't necessarily even know if it's what they're doing on the defensive end because Baylor ended up shooting 43% from two and 30% from three in that game against the Jayhawks. And Kansas State only shot 41% from two and 41% from three. You have to, if you are Kentucky in this game, do two things. Guard the perimeter Make sure that that does not become an extra factor of their offense. That has to happen in this game. You cannot let Kansas get hot from three. To be completely honest with you, I don't think from a matchup standpoint, Kentucky's really going to struggle with that because Kansas doesn't have a lot of great three-point shooters to begin with. But I digress. The second thing I think Kentucky has to do in this game is get to the foul line. You look at the recipe for success for opponents recently. Baylor shot 25 free throws. They made 20 of them. Kansas State shot 33 free throws and made 26 of them. Do you remember just a couple of days ago, a couple of episodes ago, it might have been before the Vanderbilt game, I pointed out one of the most important things for Kentucky right now is the way that they are shooting from the foul line. They shot well against Tennessee. They shot well against Georgia. It's been a crucial factor in their games as of late. And right now, I think that may, that may be one of the biggest things that we're looking at at the end of the day in this contest. You look at the Tennessee game. Kentucky shot 25 free throws. They made 22 of them. You look at the Georgia game, 23 of 30. Texas A&M, 11 of 17. Probably the worst outing, I think, out of the, these last four games when it comes to foul line percentage. But whenever Kentucky has needed to step up, they've actually gone to the line and they, they've executed. Not every single team is going to be able to do what Vanderbilt did, which is just completely shut down Kentucky from the foul line. But all of this to say, I think it's pretty clear what Kentucky, from a number standpoint, has to try and take advantage of. They have to make sure that Kansas does not become dynamic. Hold them, make them one-dimensional. Statistically, on either end of the floor, they don't do anything particularly well. I think this game is less about the numbers and more about the matchups. I want to go ahead and get into some of these individual matchups. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Link, or excuse me, at FanDuel. Ooh, almost messed that up. You know, sometimes you're looking at the wrong ad read. The NFL playoffs are here, and we are really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they are the number one sports book in America, and that's FanDuel. If you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. And new customers, you can join today to get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. All you have to do is sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. FanDuel has all your favorite bets over there from the money line, point spreads, player props. You can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. NFL playoffs rolling along here this weekend. You've got two massive championship games. Those games are going to be tight. Going to be a lot of fun player props on that one. Check out something, by the way, this is not in the read. Check out check out some interesting player props with Devonta Smith, receiver for the Eagles. If you're going over there, and I would highly encourage you guys to do so, check that out and give me your thoughts on that. It's all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, you do not want to miss out, especially this weekend. You can place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, continuing along here on the Friday edition of Locked On, Kentucky Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. So we've gone through the numbers for the, or for the, for the Jayhawks. There's nothing particularly impressive about what they do 
statistically that I think could give them an advantage in this game. By the way, if we're just looking at very basic numbers from a points per game average, they're good, but they're not great. It's 75.9 points per game that they score a contest. And they've got some really good players that I think we need to really be paying attention to. It all starts with Jalen Wilson, their forward. He is currently leading them in points per game and rebounds per game. He is a national player of the year candidate, six foot eight junior out of Denton, Texas. Again, like I mentioned, he's averaging 21.4 points per game, 8.6 rebounds per game, two and a half assists per game, and he's shooting 43% from the floor. Those are the numbers that you need to know about Jalen Wilson. And over these past three games, he has been tearing it up. He has scored 38 points in that loss against Kansas State, 30 points against TCU, and 23 points against Baylor. Now, granted, Kansas lost all three of those games, but it was not because of the way that their star player performed. He ended up getting a decent chunk of their points in almost every single one of those contests. You have to be able to find a way to keep this guy at bay. He is an all-around scoring threat. He can beat you at the rim. He can shoot threes. He's also a very, very good foul shooter. He's shooting almost 78% from the line. He's an all-around forward that I think is going to give Kentucky problems. I will be very curious to talk about matchups here for a second, how Jacob Toppin defends him. Jacob Toppin has been a good defender for the Wildcats this season. Heard no complaints about Jacob Toppin. But right now, he has maybe the biggest challenge of the season if Kentucky elects to put him on Jalen Wilson, which I can only assume they will. They're not going to put Shibwe on him because Shibwe will be fighting more down low. Jacob Toppin, I think, is the perfect player to end up putting on Jalen Wilson, but he has to be able to stick with him. This is the matchup. This is the biggest thing for me. And look, we talked on yesterday's show about how I believe that Jacob Toppin right now is an underrated, underappreciated player on this roster. He's playing like a first-round pick. This is the game. This is the game right here where I think Jacob Toppin could really make a name for himself by trying to shut down and eventually shutting down Jalen Wilson if he does do so. That would be massive. There is another six foot eight forward that I think could also give Kentucky problems. And this is interesting to me that Kansas, like I mentioned, has so many lengthy players, it's going to be interesting to me to see how Kentucky rotationally approaches this from a defensive perspective. Grady Dick, pause to make fun of the name, 14.9 points per game, 5.2 rebounds per game. He's shooting 45% from the floor. He is another one of these kids for Kansas that excels in transition. I've watched this kid play in person. I got to see him whenever I was at the, uh, the Champions Classic earlier this year, this year, whenever Kentucky, or excuse me, yeah, when Kentucky was taking on Michigan State and then uh, Kansas was taking on Duke, he ended up going for 14 points in this game. He shot 6 of 11 from the floor. He was a big factor in this one, and he is just a freshman. Very, very talented player. I've been watching highlights of this kid since he was in high school. I've been watching this kid for quite some time now. He is one of the guys that can make their stuff go whenever they want to get out and run. And Kansas, on the offensive end of the floor, is one of the quicker teams in the country. They're top third nationally in terms of adjusted tempo and average possession length. They're slower on the defensive end, which is really, really interesting to see that they have been been able to kind of hold opponents at times, maybe past where they're comfortable in terms of time of possession. But anyway, Grady Dick is the second most important player. He's also the second leading scorer. He, right now, I think is a very interesting factor in this matchup, again, because of what Kentucky may end up doing rotationally in this game. Because as you know, Chris Livingston, according to John Calipari, has just, has maybe made some progress at the four after starting at some, or excuse, not starting, playing small forward primarily for the Wildcats. He now, apparently, after this Vanderbilt game, is going to start working at the four a little bit more. I wonder what rotationally... Kentucky does if Grady Dick and Jalen Wilson are on the floor at the same time. Do you end up swapping out Antonio Reeves at the three for Chris Livingston at the three? You play Jacob Toppin at the four. You play Oscar Sheboy at the five or Lance Ware, depending on how the rotation's working. And do you just say to, to Livingston, go out and guard him, go out and handle him. You're just as physical. You're just as tough. Be the guy in transition. Are you going to ask your freshman to step up and do that? 
Because as of right now, if I'm not mistaken, Damian Collins is still suffering an injury or suffering through an injury. Yugunna and Yenzo right now also probably not going to play in this game. I'm curious to see what this front court battle looks like between Jacob Toppin, Jalen Wilson, Grady Dick, and maybe Chris Livingston if you liked, if you would like for him to get involved down low. It's going to be very interesting to me. That is where the game starts and ends for me. And then the interesting factor on the outside when you look at Kansas from a, from a guard standpoint, they've got one guard that averages six and a half assists per game. Outside of him, they've got Bobby Pettiford Jr., who only plays about 15 minutes a game, doesn't really get a whole lot in terms of guard minutes. They just don't have a lot of... They, they, they are, they're very weirdly rotation, rotation Kansas's guards are. They've got Dejuan Harris Jr., who is averaging only 7.2 points per game, but like I mentioned, six and a half assists per game. Arguably their best three-point shooter out of, outside of Grady Dick. This is a team that can push it. They can make you uncomfortable. They have length. They don't necessarily have a ton of size when it comes to the center position, which is great for Kentucky because of how Oscar Shibway has been handled against more physical players this year. The two players that I did not mention that are in that six foot six, six foot eight range for uh, Kansas. Kevin McCuller, who is a transfer from Texas Tech, he's one of their starters, really solid on the defensive end. He's almost top 25 in steal percentage, uh, according to Kim Palm. And then KJ Adams. Uh, who was really solid for them last year? Also, another starter for them at six foot seven. They've got a lot of forwards that they can play with, and if one's not playing well, they can slot somebody else in to potentially out outperform them. But again, just to kind of recap, the most important matchups in this game to me, it's going to be Jacob Toppin against Jalen Wilson and Grady Dick, and then how Kentucky rotationally handles their front court is going to be fascinating because I can't sit here and tell you how they're going to do it. I just know that it's going to be a problem. And I'm not saying like, it, oh, well, K- Kentucky's going to lose the game because it's so big of a problem. I'm just saying that's where the matchup starts and ends. Antonio Reeves has to continue his streak of shooting well. I think this is going to be a little bit more of a physical game than some people might anticipate. This is a good Kansas squad that has played a lot of really tough teams. I anticipate this one being physical. I anticipate this one being difficult. I think Kentucky ends up winning this game, but I think it's going to be a dogfight. It's going to be no different from what they've faced in the SEC thus far. And Kansas, to be completely honest with you, has faced a significantly tougher slate in the Big 12. This is going to be a tough one. But Kentucky has to have it if they want to continue to build some momentum and build up that resume. This is the biggest game of the season thus far, and arguably it's going to be the biggest game of the season, period. Although I will say, You want to see Kentucky play well whenever they play Tennessee here in just a few weeks. And you also want to see them play well against Auburn. And you also want to see them close out the the year strong against Arkansas. They'll get them home and away. But this right now is a chance to really prove that they do belong in the NCAA tournament. I want to get to bracketology. I want to talk about where the Wildcats are because they are rising. This This is an opportunity to get even further up the rankings right now. Before I do that, I just want to remind you guys to subscribe to the show. If you have not subbed on YouTube, please go ahead and do so. It would mean a ton. I don't just say it just to say it. I do want you to subscribe to the channel. If you want to continue to watch the show, you'll get easy updates every single day uh, in your timeline over on YouTube. And then also, if you're listening on podcast, please leave a review for the show. It would mean a ton, and I am more than willing to read it. If you, <laughs> if, if you truly do think the show is worth five stars, Uh, don't just leave the five stars. Go ahead and let me know what you think about the show as well. Would greatly appreciate it. All right, wrapping up the Friday edition of Locked On, Kentucky Lance Dahl. Hanging out here with you. Bracketology for ESPN and CBS. Again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, last season, whenever you and I went over bracketology, it felt kind of fruitless at times because it did not feel as significant as maybe a team on the bubble would feel about their chances of getting into the tournament. Now, Kentucky is a fringe NCAA tournament team. They're in the field, right, because of their win streak and that win against Tennessee. They're in the field, but they have work to do if they're going to make it. And they need to to execute in every opportunity that they get to beat a legitimate opponent. This weekend, is I, I continue to say it, 
It's so important, so important for this season and their, this outcome. It also gives us a legitimate idea of whether or not Kentucky, hey, if they get to the tournament, let's say they get past that first round, who are they looking at? They're probably looking at a three seed, right? Or they're looking at a two seed, depending on where they slot in. Do they have the ability to knock that team out? I think this game will be a great indication of whether or not they do. So you look at ESPN's bracketology last week, if I'm not mistaken, they were listed as the first team out uh, by, uh, by Joe Lenardi. Now they are currently sitting in the last four buys, which means they are past the last four in. They are currently right now, according to Lenardi, an 11 seed in the South region, and they would be playing Illinois, which I think I said this last time we talked about bracketology. I want no, no, nothing to do with that team. But they're back in the field and they're rising. They're up at, as an 11 seed on ESPN. And according to ESPN's bracketology, Kansas is a two seed. So essentially what we're seeing right now, as the season starts to wind down, we're in the final third here. We get a better idea of where teams are going to be ranked at the end of the year, we're going to get a better idea of where teams are going to be seated. This is not a two versus an 11. I don't think both these teams are going to finish exactly there at two and at 11. I think one of them is probably going to end up being a little bit more different, i.e. Kentucky. But this is a pretty decently assessed matchup. It is somewhere around an 11 to 7 seed versus a 1 to a 3 seed. And the lower seed gets the gets the home field advantage. That's obviously a, another huge factor in this game. And then you look over at CBS Sports. You're seeing similar things for Kansas. They are currently a two seed in the West region. Kentucky, though, a 10 seed, according to Jerry Palm of CBS Sports. A 10 seed in the Midwest region. They would be taking on NC State uh, if that were to hold. So CBS, like we talked about last time, we took a look at bracketology a little bit higher, more consistently than than uh, than ES, ESPN is. And then if you look at the way CBS grades their seeds, not only do they grade the seed as like, oh, well, he's a four seed or he's a three seed, but they also rank every single team in the field of 68 from one to 68. As of right now, Kentucky is the second best 10 seed. They're the second best 10 seed behind Nevada. They're uh, above Iowa, who is 12 and 8 right now, and above Clemson, who is 17 and 4. If they want to make that push to maybe even the 8 seed spot up there with Missouri, Memphis, Wisconsin, and USC, this, can, this Kansas win would almost certainly do that. Would almost certainly do that. You're getting a team that's reeling, you're getting a team that has lost three straight. You're getting a team that is stumbling right now and is trying to find momentum. Kentucky has won four straight games. They have found that momentum. They have taken down a couple of really good opponents in that stretch, one of them being a top 10 team on the road. Of course, Kentucky could lose this game. I'm not saying that they don't, that that they're going to just objectively win and they're going to win by 20. We saw how they played against South Carolina. But this is a game where all signs point to the Wildcats having the momentum. And I think if they are able to throw the first punch in this one, Rupp Arena and the momentum and the confidence that they have built is going to help them and aid them as the contest goes on. I think Kentucky wins this one, and I want to know what you guys think in the comments below. Give me a score prediction for this game tomorrow. I think it's the biggest game of the year. If you disagree, let me know in the comments. Tell me why you think it's not. Because this right now, I think, is where the season could take a massive turn for the better. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show over on Twitter at Locked On UK. Follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore. And you can follow the show on Instagram. That is over at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the YouTube comments. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow. We will be doing a recap episode of this game over the weekend. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And God bless.